that I am completely discouraged that so little has changed and that so many First Nations individuals and families continue to live in substandard homes. Tonight, the Auditor General gives a failing grade to the federal government. This is an initiative that will save lives. Moving ahead with a red dress alert. The only way that you can really fail is not trying. Um, it doesn't really matter the result as long as you tried. And a singer from Saskatchewan is showing off her voice on Canada's Got Talent. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin tonight in Ottawa, where today the Auditor General released reports on First Nations housing and policing. And to no one's surprise, Karen Hogan gave the federal government failing grades on both. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. Bonjour. Good afternoon. Auditor General Karen Hogan says nothing has changed in the past 20 years when it comes to the poor quality housing First Nations communities have become used to. After four audit reports, I can honestly say that I am completely discouraged that so little has changed and that so many First Nations individuals and families continue to live in substandard homes. The auditor's latest report finds Ottawa has only completed 20% of its commitment to close the First Nations housing gap by 2030. First Nations people are four times higher to live in overcrowded housing and six times higher to live in homes needing major repairs than the non-Indigenous population, according to the 2021 census. And mold continues to be a problem in many First Nations homes. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Hyde acknowledges that there are problems but says the government remains committed to closing the First Nations housing gap by 2030. That's why that goal is in place, so that it focuses the mind of all departments of the Government of Canada that we need to work faster and that we need to be making ambitious investments like the ones we've already made, but I would argue more, and that we need to be working with partners to make sure that we have the creative solutions to closing that, uh, that gap. When it comes to First Nations policing services, Hogan says the government didn't do well in this area either. All too often, her report finds, money targeted for these services isn't getting to where it is supposed to. We also found that because of staffing shortages over the past five years, the RCMP has been unable to fully staff the positions for which it receives funding under the program's agreements. This leaves First Nations and Inuit communities without the level of proactive and community-focused policing services that they should receive. The auditor's report finds $13 million targeted for First Nations policing services in the 2022-2023 fiscal year went unspent, and 62 RCMP positions funded under the Community Tripartite Agreement went unhired. Public Safety Minister Dominic LeBlanc says staffing shortages have been a problem, but believes new RCMP Commissioner Mike Duhame is making headway. It's not a secret, Commissioner Duhem has talked about some of the challenges around recruitment uh, in the RCMP and filling some of the vacant positions that exist. I think he's got an effective plan that will and has already started uh, to deal with this challenge, but that's one of the realities that the RCMP is facing. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Still in Ottawa, NDP MP Leah Gazan pushed forward the idea of red dress alerts on Parliament Hill. The alerts would be a Canada-wide emergency system to help find missing Indigenous women and girls. A year ago, the red dress motion received unanimous support in the House of Commons. Today, the Standing Committee on the Status of Women began their study on the topic. Annette Francis has more. NDP MP Leah Gazan has been at the helm for the calls to action. Last May, she gathered in the foyer of West Block with families of missing or murdered. I am standing alongside my sisters today to support them in their calls to fully on the government to fully support a Canada-wide emergency 
immediately support the development of a national red dress alert system without delay. A Canada-wide system would alert the public through cell phones and other media when an Indigenous woman, girl or two-spirit person goes missing. On Tuesday, before the Committee on the Status of Women began its first study on red dress alerts, Gazan addressed the media. We know from the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls calls for justice 9.1 to 9.11 that current systems that are there to protect us aren't. This is a critical initiative. This is an initiative that will save lives. And I'm urging the Liberal government to uh, get this through uh, with proper consultations by the Indigenous community. Later, the committee so welcomed its first witnesses. One of them was Kurt Ebby, a director at Palmerex, the company that operates the weather alert system. He said a red dress alert would take no time to put in place. Everyone's familiar with the Amber Alert. We recently added silver alerts to the system, which is um, if someone with, uh, with, with um, Alzheimer's or dementia or cognitive uh, disabilities goes missing, um, you issue what's called silver alert. Um, that's being piloted in Quebec. The, there has been some silver alerts issued. It's really no different than that. It's another vulnerable person use case, and you would add that to the system and, and issue the alerts um, the same way. And um, I think this is a well-known issue. I think Canadians generally, if they saw red dress alert, they would understand what it was talking about. Jennifer Jesty created her own system, the Unamagi Emergency Alert. It serves five Mi'kmaq First Nations. Once subscribed to it, one can choose to receive an alert through text message, email, or landline. Jesty developed it in response to the Nova Scotia mass shooting in April 2020. She said, however, there have been challenges because law enforcement has not requested the use of her alert system. So we did have um, uh, an Indigenous woman go missing reported by an off-community off or off-reserve organization. She didn't show up for curfew. They immediately phoned the police to say, this was at 10 o'clock at night, to say, hey, she didn't show up for curfew. The police chose not to request an alert to be sent out by me, and she was found dead the next morning. Would my alert have saved her life? Maybe, maybe not. But you didn't even give me a chance. According to Gazan, there are four more committee meetings scheduled for the study. The consultation process will continue, but there is no deadline to have the system in place yet. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. Jeffrey Papti has been on a healing journey for the last 16 years. Recently, the day school survivor from Lac Simon in Quebec was invited to speak at a Catholic gathering in Trois-Rivières. Our reporter Maricela Amador was on hand and spoke with Papati. And a warning, this report contains sensitive material on sexual assault. I have the courage to come here because I have traveled with a lot of anger. Jeffrey Papati is talking about the abuse and pain he suffered at day school. He shared his story in front of an audience that included priests, bishops, and other members of the Catholic Church. For many in attendance, it was their first time witnessing a story by a day school survivor. Papati has been sober for over 16 years and said that speaking his truth in the basement of a church was another step on his journey toward recovery and healing. He told the gathering that after he had been abused as a child by a priest, he lived his life in shame and fear. Papati recounted spending decades working on himself, adding that in the beginning it was incredibly hard to talk about his experience in day school. Marilyn Roy, the coordinator at the Notre Dame de Fatima Catholic Mission in Kujouak, said that Papati's words touched her deeply. C'est sûr que moi, c'est une question qui me travaille depuis longtemps, d'une manière particulière depuis sept ans. Ça a été une question que 
que j'ai porté au quotidien. Euh, je dirais qu'en tant qu'alloctone, je trouve qu'il y a un chemin, en tout cas, qui est favorable à cette réconciliation-là. Roy a dit qu'il était nécessaire de écouter les histoires des survivors et de résonner avec eux. At an event billed as one of reconciliation, Gilles Lemay, a bishop emeritus from Trois-Rivières, did not want to talk much about it. La nécessité de la réconciliation, elle est réelle. Euh, bon. Donc, euh, je ne m'étendrai pas trop là-dessus. For survivors who are still struggling from their trauma, Papati had this to say. Je le suggère juste de prendre, d'avoir du courage à l'intérieur, de se libérer les choses qui ont mal. The Hope for Wellness Helpline provides immediate help. To reach the helpline, dial a toll-free number shown on the screen. Maricela Amador, APTN National News, Trois-Rivières, Québec. Indigenous leaders from Labrador and Quebec First Nations were in Ottawa attending federal court on Tuesday. They want the court to rule against a memorandum of understanding between the federal government and the Nunakavut Community Council. This press conference was held by the leaders of the Inu Nation of Labrador, the Nunatsiavut government, Inuit Taparit Kanatami, and the Assembly of First Nations of Quebec and Labrador. The MOU was signed in 2019 between the federal government and the New Nakavut Community Council, or NCC. Part of the MOU was to recognize the indigenous rights of the NCC. However, all of the leaders at the press conference expressed the opinion that the NCC is not a legitimate rights-bearing indigenous organization. Grand Chief Simone Poco of the Inu Nation says the NCC poses a risk to their lands and resources. NCC has no section of 35 rights. They are not indigenous group that can hold rights. They are descendants of settlers who try to reinvent themselves to access resources, services, meant for legitimate indigenous people. Time for a quick break, and then we'll take you to Vancouver, where two Spirit Day celebrations are underway. Stick around. Welcome back. The government of Yukon raised the Two Spirit flag outside the legislative building Tuesday in honor of Two Spirit Day. Two Spirit Day, or Two Spirit and Indigenous LGBTQIA Plus Awareness Day, falls on the spring equinox. The Yukon is one of the first jurisdictions in Canada to recognize the spring equinox as Two Spirit Day. Government officials say proclaiming Two Spirit Day on the spring equinox when the day and night last almost the same amount of time celebrates new beginnings and positive change. Jade Lacrosse, who is Anishinaabe and Klingit, serves on the National Two-Spirited Guidance Committee for the Community-Based Research Center. I want to let everyone know that as Two-Spirit and Indigenous queer people, as queer people, we have always been here. We are here today, and we will always be here. Now to Vancouver, where Two-Spirit Day is currently underway, and what started as a citywide celebration last year became a provincial day with an official proclamation and now organizers are hoping to make it a national day. APTN's Tina House joins us from the event. Thank you. Well, today is spring and also National Two-Spirit Day. Joining me today is Martin Warburg. Martin, tell me about this day and what it means for you. So today is about centering our Two-Spirit relatives and the kinship of Two-Spirit people, Indigenous, queer and trans folks uh, across Turtle Island and really just a way to resurge and reclaim and to bring visibility and awareness and celebration to our Two-Spirit kinship. Awesome. And celebrating you will be doing here today. Tell me about the event today. So the event has uh, some local nations that are opening us in a good way. We will have some powwow performances, we have some artist vendors, uh, we'll be having a talk show ho uh, with Two-Spirit activists, and then we have a lineup of drag performers. Sounds pretty awesome. Why today? Why on Spring Equinox? Why today? Is, why, is, why is that significant? 
So the spring equinox and the teaching that we received from one of our mentors, a uh, longtime Two-Spirit activist, Harlan Pruden, actually coined it and shared that teaching with us. The spring equinox is an uh, in-between place, coming out of the darkness and moving into the light. And I think historically, Two-Spirit people occupied those in-between spaces. And so it's really about renewal, about rebirth, about moving towards the light and uh, just kind of moving into that space of visibility. Incredible. Now, it started here in Vancouver in 2022, the Two-Spirit Day, but tell me about your initiative across the country. So it started in 2022 as an online event. Uh, we were able to get a proclamation from the city of Vancouver. In 2023, we did an in-person celebration and we were able to get a proclamation from the province of BC. And now this year, we have invited our uh, Two-Spirit Relative organizations to join us. So there has been proclamations uh, secured in Edmonton, Alberta, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, um, also in Whitehorse, Yukon. And then we have other celebrations happening in Toronto, um, Sault Ste. Marie and Lac Seul in Northern Ontario. So we are hoping in the next couple of years that we'll be re uh, recognized nationally and we will have this day proclaimed as National Two-Spirit Awareness and Celebration Day. Incredible. Martin Warburg, always nice to see you. Congratulations and today you. we honour you. Thank you so much for all your work. Thank yes. you. Back to you in studio. Thanks, Tina. Sure looks like spring out there. Minus 30 for us here tonight. A singer from Saskatchewan is about to make her big debut on Canada's Got Talent. More on that coming up after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And Clarence Jones sent in an amazing sunset as seen by a lone totem from the Gitsi Gukla in the Gitsan Nation. Thanks as always, Clarence. You can send your photos by email to share at apcan.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, seven above in a cloudy day in Halifax, plus four in Fredericton. Minus six with snow in Kujuak, seven below in Nain, plus six with snow in Montreal, minus seven and flurries for Val d'Or. Plus one in snow in Sault Ste. Marie, flurries and three below for North Bay. Minus five in Thunder Bay, cloudy and ten below in Sioux Lookout. Minus fifteen for God's Lake, minus twelve in Norway House. Ten below in Winnipeg, minus nine in Dauphin. Cloudy in minus six for Regina and Yorkton, minus nine in Saskatoon. Six below for Meadow Lake, sunny and 12 below in Buffalo Narrows. In northern Alberta, sunny and minus two in Peace River, sun's out and minus nine in Fort McMurray. Minus three with snow in Edmonton, plus nine and flurries for Lethbridge. 12 in Vancouver and Victoria, cloudy and 15 in Kamloops. Four above for Prince George, Snow and seven in Smithers. Minus 14 in Old Crow. Cloudy and plus five for Whitehorse. Minus 19 in Yellowknife. 14 below with snow in Norman Wells. Minus 25 in Saks Harbor. One degree warmer for Polytech. Minus 20 in Chesterfield with snow. 24 below in Arviette. Minus 26 in Resolute. 25 below in Arctic Bay. A new season of Canada's Got Talent kicks off tonight and it features some Saskatchewan talent. Rebecca Strong from Prince Albert is sharing her experience on the hit talent show. Our reporter Rachel May spoke with Strong about taking one of the, taking to one of the biggest stages in the country. For Rebecca Strong, singing is her passion. So when this opportunity opened up for me, I had to I had to take a hold of it. Strong says it all started with an online application where she sent in a few videos of herself doing cover songs. About a month later, she got a call telling her to come and audition for the show's judges. Strong is 20, but has been on stage singing a variety of genres since she was five. She said she always gets nervous before a performance. This 
kind of thing was even more nerves and just being up there and representing my people was very it made me very proud of being indigenous strong hopes that people who see her perform and want to follow in her footsteps go out and submit their auditions the only way that you can really fail is not trying um, it doesn't really matter the result as long as you try it. Strong will be featured on episode 2, which airs next week, March 26th. Country and gospel singer Terry Ann Strong, arm of Balcara, Saskatchewan, will also be featured on this season of Canada's Got Talent. Rachel May, ABTN National News, Saskatoon. Best of luck to them. Before you tune in for that, a new episode of Face to Face is coming up next right here after our newscast. But you won't be seeing me in the host chair this time. Our guest host, Sav Jones, uh, will be talking with artist, designer, and television personality, Lance Cardinal. Uh, Cree Two-Spirit from Alberta, Cardinal has been bringing much needed representation to the mainstream. He hosts his own show on APTN called Indigenous Art Adventures and has designed for brands like IKEA and the Edmonton Oilers. Tonight, Cardinal shares how his identity shapes his work. I remember, you know, one of my elders recently bringing me into the forest and to, to talk with me about, about my, my art and who I was as an artist. And I was really sort of conflicted about, you know, was my two-spirit self part of that journey? Was it important or was it even valued as an Indigenous person? Um, and so that elder who brought me into the forest to, to tell me, you know, we want to tell you that you are valuable. Your two-spirit side is part of you, and it's a healing gift. And, and that elder told me that that was my gift, that was part of my gift as a healer, was my art, and that my two-spirit self was accepted. Sad news to leave you with tonight as condolences are pouring in for former NHL enforcer Chris Simon, who has passed away at the age of 52. A statement shared by the NHL Alumni Association said, quote, Chris was never afraid to stand up for his teammates and played a key role in the dressing room. He was a beloved father, friend, brother, and son. Simon was drafted 25th overall in the 1990 draft, and during his lengthy NHL career, he played for eight different teams and appeared in nearly 800 regular season games scoring 305 points. Simon, who was Anishinaabe, became a Stanley Cup champion with the Colorado Avalanche in the 1995-96 season. Our condolences to his family, friends, and teammates. Loved when he played for my Nordiques back in the day. Sad news indeed. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Marcy McGwitch, thanks for being with us. Stick around. Face to Faces next. Have a great night.